The concept of ejecting from a starfighter is one of the oldest features of Star Wars lore, appearing in the very first film. I've got a problem here. Eject! I can hold it! Hold on! No, I'm all right. But how would this work? Obviously, I've already given you a glimpse as to how I think this should work, but how did I come to the conclusion that I did? Let's jump into it. Now, the Expanded Universe has long answered this question with the assumption that the X-Wing must have an ejection seat, like a modern fighter jet, but I have a lot of problems with this. Firstly, the average X-Wing pilot is simply not equipped for the vacuum of space. He has an apparently unsealed suit and an open helmet. Now, you could argue that the flight suit has some sort of auto-deploying features that seal it into a proper spacesuit, or the chair upon ejection emits some kind of atmospheric shield bubble, but if we're assuming a catastrophic failure that necessitates ejection, you simply would not leave the bare necessities of survival in the hands of some finicky technology. The suit might not completely close. That force field bubble might flicker for the briefest moment. The slightest thing goes wrong, and your pilot might as well have stayed with the ship. My next set of issues, and probably more importantly, is the role of the X-Wing as a starfighter. And not just a starfighter, but an interstellar starfighter. Its primary operating conditions are in space, easily deep space, and possibly on the other side of the galaxy from friendly territory. Ejected pilots may be caught in a gravity well and forced to survive atmospheric entry to land on a nearby planet. Pilots may need to drift in deep space for days waiting for rescue. Pilots need to eat and sleep and stay hydrated for that time. And while these concerns are things that the storytelling of Star Wars doesn't really trouble itself with, they're definitely considerations relevant to designing an ejection system, fictional or otherwise. A simple ejection seat does not satisfy all the needs of our hapless star pilot. But fortunately, we're not stuck with just that one option. The history of aviation is filled with examples of ejection systems that fully enclose the pilot. Many of these were specifically designed to help the pilot survive extreme conditions such as low pressure, high temperature, and multisonic speeds. Possibly most famously was the escape capsule of the F-111, which involved ejecting the entire cockpit, which was propelled away from the aircraft with rocket motors and brought down to safety with parachutes and airbags, which even allowed it to land safely in the water. These escape systems were cutting-edge technology in the 1960s and 70s and were specifically designed to widen the range of survivable ejections, and are almost certainly the sort of system you'd see on a real starfighter. As such, it's very conceivable that George Lucas had something like this in mind when he wrote ejection into his script in the first place. Now, I've never actually heard X-Wing ejection mentioned by anyone who worked on the film, but when I look at the original X-Wing miniature, I see this consistent break in the paneling here. Mind you, this is not the edge of the canopy, this is something different. There's this fairly clear separation, a border going all the way around the cockpit, and the whole area, including the canopy, is an entirely different color from the rest of the ship. And this color difference is a common feature on the X-Wing. It almost looks like this part of the ship is meant to read as a separate module, something that might have been separately installed, and the paint colors don't quite match the specific paint job for each individual fighter. Now, obviously, that's pure speculation on my part, but it is an interesting feature nonetheless. At any rate, this sort of system is a perfect model for X-Wing ejection, because it gives us a lot of flexibility to address the needs of our pilot. It naturally contains a pressurized atmosphere, and has room for life support systems to maintain that atmosphere. Furthermore, we can install a robust maneuvering and thrust system that allows the escape module to exit the engagement zone and move to a point of relative safety. Multiple thrusters allow it to hold position for rescue, or in rare circumstances could even allow it to land on a planet, though I'd imagine that you're stuck down there once you do. This is an escape pod, not a proper spacecraft. Also, the cockpit of an X-Wing is relatively spacious, and we can imagine that a cockpit escape pod could easily store basic emergency supplies, like shelter, food, backup power sources, and other essentials for life in the darkness of space. Now, it is worth mentioning the fate of the astromech droid in an ejection scenario. I imagine that the droid ejecting in parallel with the escape pod would merely complicate and add additional risk to the process. The last thing you want is ejecting in a hectic scenario and finding your canopy blown in by a stray astromech. 
astromech. And there are actually a number of potential benefits to leaving the astromech on board. There's always that one in a million chance that the droid might actually regain control of an out of control X-Wing, or at least direct the fighter to crash in relative safety. If the droid fails its emergency protocols after the pilot has ejected, it is possible that the droid may still eject at that point if it has the proper equipment, or failing that, it may at the very least launch a data recovery device if the fighter goes down in friendly territory. So that's my perspective on X-Wing ejection, and really, you can apply this to all the Rebel fighters in the original trilogy. Now, I understand that there is existing Star Wars media that contradicts me on this topic, but in my opinion, this is the most sensible answer to the question, and I had a lot of fun exploring it. Now to close out, I'd like to announce that on March 1st, I'm launching a Kickstarter campaign for a Star Wars fan film that I've been producing called Trial on the Island Moon. The campaign will run for the entire month of March, and we hope to raise enough funds to not only cover the current fan film, but also secure funding for additional narrative projects in the future. So if you'd like to pledge your support, stay tuned for the campaign launch on March 1st at noon Eastern Standard Time. There is lots of exciting stuff in store for this channel. And with that, thank you all so much for your support, and I hope to see you next time.